All right, let's look at Revelation. So uh, I know that uh, some of you have not uh, been here through the entire series, so I will just say a couple of words about it, not to reiterate myself too much, but just to kind of set, set the tone. And that is that the basic two views about when Revelation was written. One view, it says, and the prime, the, probably the predominant view, is that it was written in the 90s in Domitian's reign. And therefore, it refers to the destruction or the fall of the Roman Empire, generally speaking. That, of course, uh, didn't take place until 476 A.D. The Western Empire collapsed at that point. The Eastern Empire, which was located in Constantinople, remained for another thousand years. So it lends itself, that view lends itself to a lot of, uh, in my view, in my opinion, speculations about when these things will be fulfilled. I believe not only is it much easier, and it's not the reason I take this view, but I believe that the, the book was written in the 60s prior to the destruction of Jerusalem and refers, therefore, to the, the fall of Judaism that took place in 70 AD. That being the case, the material in the book of Revelation was written for the things shortly to come to pass. He tells us that in chapter 1, 1 through 3. He tells us that in chapter 22, 6 through 10, the first and last, just like you're going into the temple and there's the pillars of Jacob and Boaz, one on either side of the door, says shortly to come to pass, shortly to come to pass. So the things in Revelation are shortly to come to pass. And I believe that referring to particularly the destruction of Jerusalem and the wars at that particular time. So that being the case, the book of Revelation divides into two sections, chapters 1 through 11, actually 4 through 11, which is the revelation of, of Jesus Christ, that is about the wars that would take place. And then the second half, chapters 12 through 22, emphasizes more the church and God's people. But it's basically a doublet, that is, just like Joseph's dreams. Remember, Joseph had the dream of the corn, and he had the dream of the kind, that is, cattle, both of them refer to the same thing. And that's the same thing we have, generally speaking, in Revelation 4 through 11. Remember chapters 1 through 3 is the introductory material. 4 through 11, the revelation of Christ referring to the destruction of Jerusalem, what would take place, and the repercussions on the church. And then chapters 12 through 22, the same thing. So it's a doublet. And it's the same type of uh, situation with the entire book of Revelation. So that being the case, we've come to the last portion of Revelation, and here's how the two concluding sections line up. So the two concluding sections, notice each of them, uh, we'll, as we'll see in a moment, are really subdivided into 12 separate parts, very simple to follow. So let's look at the first one, the millennial conflict and triumph. That's chapter 19, verse 11 through chapter 21, verse 8. So just in your Bibles, you might just glance at it, and you'll see uh, how that section really is in, a, is in a, a segment of its own. So that's beginning chapter 19 and verse eight, or 11, and then running down through chapter 21, verse 8. So you have the statements, uh, verse 11, and I saw, verse, 19, uh, verse 17 of chapter 19, and I saw, verse 19, and I saw. You see how that goes all the way through chapter 20 and verse 1. You have the same language. Chapter 20 and verse 4, same language. Chapter 20 and verse 11, same language. Chapter 21 and verse 1, same language. So what, what did he see in all of these? So let's uh, glance at that very quickly. So here's what he has. Number one, we have the heavenly conqueror. That's going back to chapter 19, verse 11. It's a picture of Christ. In other words, these are simply snapshots or pictures. They're not necessarily things in chronological order. And that's where people sometimes, I think, make a mistake, and that is putting all these things in chronological order. That is to say simply, these are pictures that John gives us of those events at the last day of, the, of Judaism. So we have the heavenly conqueror. That's a picture, of course, of whom? Christ. It's Christ himself. Then the Great Supper, verses 17 through 18. What? That's a pretty uh, graphic picture. What is it picture? When glancing at it, you can see in chapter 19, verse 17, he speaks about the, the, he, they're inviting, God's inviting the animals to come and eat the flesh of kings, verse, 19, uh, verse 18. Well, that's, that's language common in the Old Testament. We find that in Ezekiel. You find it in Isaiah, Jeremiah. So that's the Great Supper. Of course, he's referring to the 
the things that are taking place at that time. But he's utilizing the language from the Old Testament. Then you have the beast and the false prophet are destroyed. Once again, we have three primary characters in the last half of Revelation. Those three primary characters are, number one, the dragon. Who's the dragon? Satan. That's correct. Satan is the dragon. Who is the beast? Now, this is referring to the sea beast that was introduced in chapter 13. The Roman Empire. Roman Empire. We had, in chapter 13, two beasts introduced. Sea beast, land beast. So the sea beast, the Roman Empire. And then we have the land beast, at that point, Judaism. But the land beast became the false prophet. And that's what we have listed later in chapter 16. So we have the dragon, the beast, the false prophet. So we have two of these, two of these characters are destroyed in chapter 19, verses 19 through 21. That would be the beast, would be what? Roman Empire and the false prophet. That would be, of course, Judaism. So <clears throat> in that, and that would, be, that would be a prophetic statement about the Roman Empire being collapsing, but we do have one character remaining, and that was be who? Still has to be handled. We just, we just laid out three. What's, what's, what's the first one? Who? I, I couldn't hear you, I'm sorry. Well, okay, we have three characters. The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. So which, which was not handled yet? Okay, the, okay. The beast and the false prophet are destroyed in 19, 19 through 21. We'll mention the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. The false prophet and the beast are both destroyed in 19. Which one is still remains? Dragon. That's, that's why we come to chapter 20, and we find dragon, the Satan, chained and imprisoned, verses 1 through 3. So now we handle the third character. So that's how it is laid out. See how that works? It just kind of goes through it. So that is what we have in chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. We looked at that a little bit at length last week, we're and we're told in verse 2, he laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, bound him for a thousand years, cast him into the abyss, and shut it, sealed it over him, that he should deceive the nations no more, until the thousand years be finished. The idea here is simply that Christ is conquering, Christ the conqueror, Satan, in the destructive and destruction of Jerusalem and destruction of Judaism which was taken out of the way because the primary persecutor of Christianity in the first century was Judaism. You read that, you cannot read the book of Acts and not come away with that conclusion. It's very, very simple. And everywhere that Paul went, the Jews tracked him and they persecuted him. They tried to kill him upon a number of occasions. And it was all because the Jews stirring it up. And they stirred it up in the, with the Roman Empire as well. So that's what we have here. Satan is now conquered, but it's only partially because we're told in verses 4 and following, the millennial reign and final overthrow of Satan is verses 4 through 10. So what happens here? We're told that he would be, this is speaking about the millennial reign of Christians. So remember, we're taking chapter 6 and verse 9, where we found that those who are beheaded for the testimony of Christ are beneath the altar. Remember that in chapter 6, verse 9, when he opened the seals? And they cried, How long, O Lord, holy and true, do you not avenge our blood of them that dwell upon the earth? Remember that statement? Now we have the answer to that in chapter 20, verse 4. I saw the souls of them had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus, for the word of God, such as worship not the beast, neither his image, receive not the mark upon the forehead in their hand, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. What is that? It's the triumph of Christianity. The triumph of Christianity in the wars that took place in the first century. We need to keep in mind that that is a principle that will always hold true. But as far as prophetic forecast, we have very simply that these are the days of the first century. The time is at hand, near to be fulfilled. He tells us that in 1, 1 through 3 and 22, verses 6 through 10. So as far as a prophetic forecast, it refers, of course, to the destruction of the primary antagonist against the church, Judaism. And that's the idea, as I understand it. So now with the, instead of underneath the altar where they were, because they had been persecuted, 
And the, what's the word for persecuting here? Not being persecuted, but what? The souls that had been beheaded, beheaded. You know, this is interesting that a lot of people say, well, uh, am I there? Well, if you're beheaded, I suppose. And, but see, there's not many people beheaded today for Christ. Uh, hmm. <laughs> so this is about be being beheaded. And it's referring to the first century Christians who were persecuted because of Christ. So that's what we have in chapter 20, verses 4 and following. <laughs> you recognize that one? <laughs> okay, that's all right. <laughs> So then the question was asked last week about verse 5, the rest of the dead live not until the thousand years be finished. I take it that that is those who are opposing Christianity, antagonists to Christ, and they would, after that, after that victory, then they themselves would once again be persecuting the church, and that's the idea in verses 6 and following. So that's what we have in the Satan let, let out of the prison, verses 7 and following, but his final his final judgment is given in verse 10. What is his final judgment? This is Satan, the dragon. What is his final judgment? Cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, and that is verse 10. And where also are the beast and the false prophet, they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's a picture, I say, of hell, and it is a torment day and night. It is not that death of the wicked is annihilation that their souls do not continue to live we have a continual punishment of those who are opposed to christ and it's going to be tormented day and night forever and ever that's how revelation sets it up any question on that any thought any objection you know i'm happy to hear objections say i don't understand or don't understand this i don't th I, I don't agree with that if you have someone to say along those lines that's perfectly fine. It's perfectly legitimate. <clears throat> All right, so let's look at the final judgment, which is chapter 20, verses 11. Should be verse 15. I have verse 5 up there. So the final judgment. So we'll take that a little bit more slowly here, because this is where we really left off. This is, of course, the sixth scene. And then we have the seventh scene, chapter 21, and verse 1. I saw a great white throne, and him that sat upon it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. There was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged out of the things which are written in the books, according to their works. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. Death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. I take it to be eternal punishment, the lake of fire. If any was not found written in the book of life, he was cast into the lake of fire. All right, so the first, the, uh, the second death here is eternal punishment. The first death was the de destruction of Judaism, and that would be also the first resurrection because Christians now are elevated from below the altar. That is, Christians who were killed are pictured they were persecuted for Christ, pictured as under the altar, chapter 6. But now they're on, verses 1 through 3, or verses 4 and following, rather, they're on thrones. There's the resurrection. It's a figurative resurrection, figurative resurrection. And so we have here now second death. This was an eternal death. Does that make sense? And that's, uh, are we following? So any, any question on that, any thought about it? I might make mention of, the, uh, of a spiritual resurrection. Some people object, say, <clears throat> well, I never heard of a spiritual resurrection. Well, haven't we? How about this passage in Romans 11? In Romans 11, Paul says, if the casting away of them is the salvation of the world, what shall the, what shall the resurrection of them be but life from the dead? Well, who's he talking about there? Well, let's just go over and take a look at it. Real quickly, this is Romans chapter 11 and verse 15. For if the casting away of them is the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? I put resurrection in there, but life from the dead is a resurrection. What is, who is he talking about? 
Well, he's talking about Jews. Chapter 9, 10, and 11 of Romans is all about the Jews. Paul has said that salvation is by grace through faith. That's, he has laid it out carefully all the way through chapter 8. But now the question is, what about the Jews? What about the Jews? What about the Jews? Paul says, all right, let's talk about the Jews. Chapters 9, 10, and 11. And he tells us, if you just glance back to chapter 9, he says they're lost, verses 1 through 5, they're lost. He says, I wish I could be anathema from Christ for my brethren's sake, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They're lost. They're gone. But he says, tells us in verses 6 to 13, he shows us not everyone, not everyone who thinks he's a Jew is really a Jew because the Jews that God cares about are spiritual Jews. And that is to say, verse 8, not the children of flesh that are children of God, but the children of the promise are reckoned for a seed. It's not the children of the flesh. It never has been about the flesh. What was the problem in the first century? They claimed that they were Jews. They're Jews by blood, Jews by flesh, but they are not children of God because they're born that way. Then he goes on to tell us in verses 19 and following, he says God had prepared another people, and it is from Jews and Gentiles, verse 24, you see that? Verse 24, Jews and Gentiles alike. But now salvation is free, chapter 10, verse 1 and following. Salvation is universal, verses 12 and following. So now let's come to chapter 11. What about the Jews? He says very plainly, he says in verse 11, did they stumble that they might fall? That is that God put it up this way so that they might fall, be cast away forever? God forbid, but by their fall. Salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. Who? Jews. Jews. They would be jealous. If their fall is the riches of the world, the loss, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more are their fullness? That is, when they come back, if Jews come back. But he says, I speak to you that are Gentiles inasmuch I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I glorify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy them that are my flesh and may save some of them. For if the casting away of them, are the Jews cast off, just said they were. The casting away of them is the reconciling of the world, Gentiles. How much more shall the receiving of them be life from the dead? They come back. It would be like life from the dead. What is that? A spiritual resurrection. And he goes on to show us that the Jews are lost. God has cut them off. He gives us a, an example of the olive tree and the branches are, and God cut them off. Gone. So, resurrection, spiritually speaking, if they come back. But that would be, of course, on an individual basis, obviously. So, going back to Revelation then, we have here a spiritual resurrection, chapter 20, verses 4 and following, where those souls had been under the altar, now they are resurrection. There's the first resurrection. They are now vindicated in the cause of Christ and the sitting on thrones. But the final end of the dragon is coming, and he gives it to us in a prophetic statement. And that takes us all the way through the rest of the chapter. Any question on that? Any thoughts? Disagreements? Okay, let's look at the final picture of this millennial conflict and triumph. In other words, the millennium is not a literal thousand years. It's simply a symbol of victory for the church in the first century. That's all. Yes, sir. What, you mean Revelation? I don't know that the Jews understood Revelation, really. Easier for them. So the question that David asked is, okay, it seems so challenging and so difficult for us. What made it easier for them? And I'm going to say this. I don't mean to uh, cross-examine us too harshly here or to indict us too harshly, but because Revelation is 98 to 99 percent taken from the Old Testament and Old Testament figures of speech, therefore we today are languishing on our understanding of it because we are not familiar with how language is used in apocalyptic style speaking. And we, for example, there are many apocalyptic passages in the Old Testament, Joel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48. When was the last time we went through Ezekiel 40 through 48? Apocalyptic passage, 
talks about the temple being rebuilt and streams flowing out of the throne of God, or out of, I should say, out of the temple area, flowing out the door, going all the way down to the Dead Sea. And what is that? It's simply symbolic of the, of the stream of life that, you know, upon the banks of which all may stand and drink if they but will. But it's a picture of the church. So Ezekiel 40 to 48, Zechariah chapter 12, 13 and 14, all prophetic, but they're apocalyptic in style. So we, we, at least this is my estimation of it, we are unfamiliar with and not very, and not very adept at working our way through apocalyptic material. We're just not very much that way. But in the first century, I think that there was much more, uh, much more recognition of apocalyptic symbols. Now, that's my thought on it, generally speaking, David. I may, be, I may be missing it there, and I may have been short on my understanding of it, but that's my thought on it. Sherry? Well, I think that's absolutely the case. Sherry pointed out, if you didn't hear her, she said that they were eyewitnesses of it in the first century of, of the events that were actually occurring and probably would be more, more ready to able to apply those things to what was going on there. And I think that probably is true. Uh, remember, the, the New Testament Christians grew up on the Old Testament. That's how they grew up. They all grew up learning the Old Testament, memorizing portions of it, being perfectly familiar with passages. And you can tell that by the way the apostles quote the Old Testament. They quote, he, Paul, when he quotes the Old Testament, he says, someone has somewhere said, well, he, then he'll come out and say, and, and Ezekiel said this, or here's what Daniel said. And he doesn't, give, he doesn't tell you where it is. You just have, but they knew. They knew exactly what he was talking about. But that's, they were just so familiar with all the texts. And so I think that's, that's true, too. They were able to see it. Plus, he does give us those time markers at the first and last of the book. These things are going to take place, he says, in this day. That's chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. These things will shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. And the time is at hand. So shortly to come to pass, time is at hand. Shortly to come to pass, time is at hand. So however one might come to the figures and say, I don't understand this, shortly to come to pass and time is at hand. Right near, right here. So that's how they would understand it. That's chapter 1, 1 through 3. And you'll see the same wording in chapter 22, 6 through 10 as you leave the book. Shortly to come to pass, time is at hand. Shortly to come to pass, time is at hand. So what, by what reasoning should people take the material here and say, it refers to the future and refers to uh, Saddam Hussein and refers to Iraq and Iran and we're seeing what's happening now in Israel and what <laughs> has, has nothing to do with really the time markers in Revelation. Yes, sir. You know, that, that really is an excellent point. It was, it was for those who were being persecuted and, and give them hope and that, because this is a book of hope. That is, even though it looks like the defeat of Christianity, it's not. But the victory, of course, belongs to Christ, and that's exactly the point. I think that is really the point of Revelation. And that, that brings us to, uh, helps us, I should say, to understand all the material in the book. And throughout the book, you have persecution, 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 whether it be in chapter 2, whether it be in chapter 16, chapter 12, all of these are persecutions. And that's, that's the people to whom it's written. Yes, sir. Right? In, in the seven churches? Well, there would be. That would be applicable to the empire, entire empire, and that's true. He asked about the seven churches, and would it be uh, applicable to those outside of that? I, I guess that's what you're asking, isn't it? Yeah, I believe so. But the seven churches are those to whom he immediately writes, which would be all of them in Asia, right there on the western coast of Asia Minor, Turkey. And that was what's taking place. And it's kind of interesting just to note that uh, you might say, well, how did that figure with Jerusalem? Because Judaism was a religious and slash political system that absolutely ruled over all of the, all of the places. I mean, they were in, coupled together with the Roman Empire. They were actually able to persecute the churches everywhere they went. And that's what we find in Acts. So it would be the removal of that. Yes, there was a church in Jerusalem. So we know that because uh, when we read the book of Acts, when Paul gets to Jerusalem, it's in this, about the year 
58, 59, and he's there in Jerusalem, and James says, look, here's what's going on, and they're going to find out you've come, and you need to go to the temple, and you need to offer this uh, sacrifice for a, a vow to show that you don't, you're not against Judaism. So he did that, but that was, of course, where uh, you might call it a mistake, I don't know, but he was arrested, and then he was almost killed right there on the spot. They almost tore him apart. But that was in the year 58, 59, and then he was taken to Caesarea, 60. So the church in Jerusalem was still there. As a matter of fact, from secular history, Josephus, you can read about the church at Jerusalem and James, what happened to James? James himself killed. They say he was thrown off one of the turrets up on top of the temple area. They threw him down. But be that as it may, that's what happened in the year 64 when the Roman armies were dispatched to destroy Jerusalem. And in the, in the church itself, the persecutions began and James was killed. But Jesus told them to get out. Remember, Jesus told the Christians to get out. So anyway, that's kind of how things were shaking out at that period of time. Good questions. Anything else? So let's look at chapter 21 for just a moment, and let's finish up this first segment. We'll finish up the last segments, and I'll give you my uh, idea on it in just a moment, and then we'll, then we'll be done with the class. So he says, I saw a new heaven and new earth. This is 21 and 1. For the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. The sea is no more. Sea, of course, represents turbulence. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a great voice out of the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He shall dwell with them, and they shall be his peoples. God himself shall be with them, and he will be their God. He shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall be there any mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. The first things are passed away. And he that sits on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. He said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. He said unto me, They are come to pass. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcomes shall inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But for the fearful, unbelieving, abominable murders, fornicators, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars, their part shall be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. All right, what is this new heaven and new earth? In my estimation, my thought, it is a reference to the perfected church or the church of God as it is coming through the bloody seas of wars. And he says that they are going to now have peace. And so that's why the sea is no more. The turbulence of, the, of, the, of that period is going to pass and the church is going to be victorious. So I, in my thinking, we have, we have not a picture of heaven, but it's a picture of the church. Now, why do I say that? Let's look at a couple of items in this text right here. Number one, we have the idea that uh, all things are made new, new heavens and new earth, taken from Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 through 19, which Isaiah is referring to the church. That doesn't mean that it has to be because Isaiah so spoke about it, but I think this is a reference to the church. That's one thing to think about. Notice also you have this in verse uh, six, I will give to him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Well, how is that to be understood as a heavenly reward? Well, the water of life that we drink from, of course, refers to Christ, and that's how our Lord puts it in John chapter seven, that out from within him shall flow rivers of living water. Or in John chapter four, when he was talking to the Samaritan woman at the well, he speaks about the water of life. And so this is the water of life that is eternal life, spiritual blessings given as far as a perfected church is concerned. Then we also have the statement is made here regarding, um, let's see, this is found, oh, verse 7, he that overcomes shall inherit these things. In other words, there's still going to be persecutions. There's still going to be, still going to be wars and difficulties that you have to overcome. And so I take it that he's referring to the church that is here. Just extending the thought just a little bit more, I want to just point out a couple of things regarding the next section, which we, have, uh, we had on the screen a moment ago. Just, just kind of fill out the picture real quickly. And that is, um, let's see, is that, yeah, that's where we want to be. So you have, for example, seven pictures here of the Holy Jerusalem, the bride. 
So, for example, just glance over chapter 22 as it finishes up the picture, verses 1 through 5. He showed me a river of water of life, bright as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and the Lamb. In the midst of the street thereof, and on this side of the river, on that side, was the tree of life, bearing twelve manners of fruits, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. How is that the case? How is it the healing of the nations? If this is a picture of heaven, then what healing needs to be done? That's one thing to think about. Glancing back here to uh, chapter 20, 21, and uh, also... Um, Let's see, where is it? Verse 23, the city has no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine upon it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the lamp thereof is the Lamb, and the nations shall walk in the midst of the light of it. Who are the nations walking in the midst of the light? I don't take it that he's referring to heaven, a heavenly reward, but referring to the perfected church in these particular passages. So, Say again. So that, that last one was 21 and verse 24. 21 and verse 24. Yeah. So that's how I understand at least 21 verses 1 through 8. Whoop, I don't have another. I had another, uh, I thought I had another chart on that one. But let me, let me mention a couple of other items real quickly before we go. Uh, another one, here's another interesting thing. He says that... Uh, did, by the way, do you see a temple in the new heavens and new earth? Is there a temple there? No, there's no, there's no temple there. But God tabernacles himself among men. How, how is that? Well, this is the temple of God, the church. He tabernacles himself among men. There is no temple, but as a reference to, I believe, in my thinking, the perfected church. So that being the case, just the overview, the thumbnail sketch of it, that throws out something for you to think about this week. Study the passage. We'll finish it up next week, Lord willing. And, and you'll have questions about it. That's great. You might have disagreements. I think it's heaven. Okay, that'd be fine. And, but we'll just talk about it some more next week. So that's how the rest of it lays out. Any thoughts? Okay. Thank you for your participation, your questions, and or objections.